All right. Okay. Welcome, everyone. So it's Friday. We're live again. And thanks to all of you who voted on both Instagram and YouTube, we decided to analyze the new Dune trailer. Now, I was super excited about Dune, Denis Villeneuve's latest outing in the epic movie, an adaptation from a, a, wild, a wildly popular book. Um, and to be honest, I didn't know how he was going to do it, but I knew it was going to be really good. Now, for those of you who don't know, about 10 months ago, they actually released, Warner Brothers released the first trailer for Dune. And this was met with a little bit of a mixed response. It's an interesting response though, because I personally loved that first trailer. It was dark, it was mysterious. And when my wife and I both watched that trailer, we were very, very excited to watch the film. Whereas the latest trailer is very, very, very different. Now, we're going to take a look at the latest trailer today. It is roughly three minutes long, so it's going to be shorter than the last live that we did. Uh, that was almost an hour long where we went through Baby Driver, and that was a, a really, really interesting analysis. But today, we're basically going to take a look at something which I think a lot of people, they miss. We, we analyze a lot of movies and a lot of TV series on this, on this channel, um, and we forget that trailers are actually incredibly complex products, incredibly complex videos and storytelling tools themselves. And they have all of their own types of, of rules and, and systems. And so today we're going to try and pick out, we're going to try and see what they're trying to do, what they're trying to tell us and how are they building this brand new world of Dune reimagined through Denis Villeneuve. So for those of you who are on the chat, don't forget, throw a comment in there. If you've got any questions, any thoughts, any of your own ideas, I'd love to hear about it. Um, very, very excited to see what you guys think of this trailer as well. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right, let's trans transition across. We've got the trailer here. Now, as you'll notice today, it's going to be a shorter video, but please don't be afraid to chuck a comment down below. It would be awesome to hear what you think or on the side, wherever the chat box is. Um, I really want to, uh, to, to make sure that you guys are included in what we do today. So anyway, as we start, we start on this very first image, which I mean, here we go. Okay, so it's gonna be bitty because the trailers by definition are very fast cuts. So I do apologize, I'm gonna start and stop a lot because there's so much to analyze throughout this trailer. But first things first, this is just epic. The movie's called Dune and the very first thing, the very, very first thing he shows us is a Dune, but he also shows us something very small. And this is something that Denis Villeneuve does a lot is he plays with scale. He always makes us recognize when something is small and when something is massive. And he does it in a way that's very unique with regards to uh, most directors. He deals generally in movement as a denotation of size. And you'll recognize that a little bit later in the trailer as well when we get to see something else that is absolutely massive. But with that in mind, we've just seen the beginning of this clip. Now it might be slightly tricky for you to see, but there are two objects floating, two or three objects floating above this, this dune, as you'll see. He says, going back. And they seem to have wings. So straight away, he's telling us, all right, you recognize a dune, but there's something a little bit different about this world than the standard world, you know? Anyway, as we do. My planet Arrakis is so beautiful when the sun is low. Rolling over the sands, you can... So... All right, before we go any further, that, that's just epic in itself. I mean, this almost feels like Gladiator. It's just beautiful. Um, and that's the very first thing he's trying to get us to see. He's trying to get us to appreciate this world, its natural, untainted, untouched beauty. And then we get to see what will become a very important character. And we assume, 
that it is her voice that we're hearing uh, and we see a woman on screen within this same environment. So we kind of feel like there is a an appreciation for the environment that she's in. Maybe this is her home. This is the type of information he's giving us. See spice in the air. Okay, let's go back. That's an important one. Rolling over the sands, you can see spice in the air. So he's now within the like the first one. What is this? 14 seconds. We've already got a pretty good idea of where this story is about to play out. We've got an idea of one of the lead characters who we are probably going to feel most morally connected to. She is, she seems to be very connected to nature, very connected to this space. And then she uses the term spice in the air. Now, obviously, again, he's trying to differentiate this world to our own. And for those of you who've read the book or seen the original um, Dune done by, oh gosh, does anyone remember the director who did the original Dune? It is just on the tip of my tongue and I'll remember it in a little bit, but that's fine. So that film was a cult classic. So Denis Villeneuve is actually doing the same thing again. He's taking a cult classic and then doing another film. Obviously, this is an re a reimagination of the first film rather than it being a sequel to the first film. So that's kind of an interesting take on it in, uh, compared to Blade Runner. But in this one, we get an idea. For those of you who haven't seen the, the original and haven't read the books, the spice is essentially a natural resource that we're going to recognise is why all of this conflict and this story is about to occur. Okay. So he goes from this natural beauty and then juxtaposes, like, switches it up on us immediately with a little kind of build-up drum in the background. Then we get this epic image. This almost, it looks like it's, we're, we're in a, a sandstorm of some type. And then we get the perfect scenario that's going to, we get the perfect image that's going to tell us what this story really is. And that is... It is a David and Goliath story. It is about the man basically taking it to something, a power that is greater than himself and trying to assert that power. So with that in mind, he's obviously going to utilize these tropes throughout. And you're going to, you're going to start to see this being repeated throughout the trailer as a motif, as a way of trying to compel us to see this film. The outsiders ravage our lands in front of our eyes. All right, so straight away we get this kind of really nice kind of drop. The music, the drums disappear. We get that kind of droning kind of sound. All right, so we know something bad is about to happen. And then we get a show of force. So this is again... Denis Villeneuve is making sure that we understand that this Goliath character, this power that's come to this planet, is overwhelmingly powerful. So he's setting the stage. He's letting us know that what's about to happen is going to require, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be pretty tricky. The characters are going to have a bit of a time to try and get through this film alive. Their cruelty to my people. Okay, let, let's watch that again because this is this is really important as well. Okay, so people get blown up, it goes to black. We fade up from black, and black is again a really important colour throughout this trailer. Their cruelty to my people. Alright, so the line that Zendaya, whatever this character's name is called, actress is Zendaya, says their cruelty to my people. And then juxtapose, well, basically marrying that to an image which lets us know this is the bad guy. This is the main antagonist we're going to have to be afraid of for this film. So, for, so, for, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so far, we've met two characters. We've met Zendaya's character, Nature. She's very in very flowing, open, you know, very, very natural looking clothes. And she seems to be at one with the environment that she's in. And then we meet this character. So immediately we're hearing chinking, we're hearing armor. He's in an environment that's very 
dark, it's very unsaturated, whereas previously we've got lots of lovely warm golden tones. He's got it's almost like a, it looks like a whip uh, or some type of tubing coming down from his armor on the front of his chest. They're cruelty to my people. And then he cuts up to the face. So their cruelty to my people. So, their cruelty to my people. All right, cool. So Dave Batista is definitely going to be the bad guy. Um, and he looks, you know, he looks the part. He looks good. He's all life now. <laughs> All right, so very, very quick imagery there. Uh, that's really, this is really important. Again, he's sending home that this guy is the antagonist. He's all I've known. All right, cool. So their cruelty is all I've known is what she says. We see people, uh, they look to be tied up, hog tied on the floor, or tied up on the floor. They're kneeling and you've got guys with either w blades or bludgeons walking behind them <laughs> and then flaming what we can only assume is bodies. Now, just behind that, you'll notice something. Is our life now? It's not just burning bodies. I'm not gonna to spend too long on this image, so I do apologize if this is distressing in some way, but it is really important to look at the background here. There is that huge monolithic structure. Again, it's just juxtaposing against the very organic fluid lines that we saw at the beginning of the film here. So you've got, Again, we've got the two different worlds colliding. We've got our David Goliath. We've got our nature versus technology. We've got, we've got the two sides of this battle being built and we really haven't gotten to know anyone yet. So let's go back to where we were. What's to become of our world? Again, world, technology, nature, Lots of things are being thrown at lots of imagery, blood on the end of a dagger. You've got people running away from running away from the camera saying maybe they're fleeing from this um, technology, from this armada that's coming for them. <laughs> that is awesome. I love the way we're drawn out of this imagery and into what's going to reveal the lead character to the trailer. Now to this, to Dune itself, What's really interesting here is most trailers would have presented the lead character within the first 30 seconds of the trailer. And actually in the original trailer, he did, but that trailer, well, as I said before, was quite ambiguous. It didn't show any of the major action set pieces. It left a lot of, um, a lot of questions in the air. It was a very mysterious trailer. Uh, and it also really focused on pain and trauma within the trailer. Whereas this one, you'll see, it seems to have more of a balance and more of a nuance between many of the aspects of the film. Is our life now? What's to become of our world? <gasps> all right, love that. <gasps> so we go from this dream world that we now recognize was a dream world golden, beautiful colors. The girl of his dreams, now we know. Subtle, Denis, subtle. And he wakes up in a room that is the complete opposite. And this is what's really interesting, the story of Dune itself, for those of you who know, for those of you who don't, that's absolutely fine. You're gonna get a lot from this trailer and it's gonna open up a lot of really fun, interesting questions and what ifs. And I think that's probably the key to this trailer is the way it builds the big what if and how. So it's the promise of an experience of a story that we will find really compelling. And I think this is where most trailers forget to build the most important part to why we would even go see a film in the first place. And that is ultimately the premise in conjunction with the character. So we have to know both by the end of the trailer. And this trailer really does it beautifully. So we end up in this room and we juxtapose, he's in this dark, almost gaudy looking room. It's almost like a cave. And so the complete opposite to the free open warmth that we were seeing in the previous shots. 
and now we go into a slightly faster beat. So this is a little bit more traditional with regards to trailers. It starts to pick up some pace now. We get some more really interesting, cool science fiction imagery, which gets us to be interested some more. It's definitely following a lot of the tropes of science fiction. Oh boy! <laughs> Duncan, can I trust you with something? Yes, always, you know that. That moment there is probably one of the key moments that ensures that we will feel a sense of empathy later in the trailer towards this character. So, a little bit earlier, you'll remember we met Mr. Baldilocks here. Sorry, Dave Batista. I mean, it's unlikely that you're watching this particular live or will watch this video at any point, but I apologize for calling you Baldilocks. Just saying. Um, We've got this character here. And then the very next shot of him. Cruelty to my people is all I've known. Burning and killing people. We recognize from the color of his clothes and the color of the background that he came from that when we meet our new hero. What's to become? He's probably a part of the same set of people, the same group. However, instead of pain and death and killing immediately after, what do we get? Oh boy. <laughs> Duncan, can I trust you with something? We get a cr an incredibly authentic and endearing set of images. First thing we see, he hugs this person. And then he states, can I trust you with something? These are both very, very interesting ways to make sure we understand that one, these two have a relationship, a friendship, and that that actually creates an empathic connection with us because now we know that he has a relationship, something to care for, something that has value and weight in his life. So maybe something to fight for. Yes, always, you know that. I've been having dreams about a girl. Miraculous. All right, so, you know, he goes straight into this. He's telling him this, he's telling his friend this particular dream, this secret, as it were. And now we get Denis Villeneuve doing a fantastic job again. He's letting us know exactly what the clear desire for this character is at the beginning of the film. So we should understand from here that well, it's going to be a journey to find this girl, the girl of his dreams. Haha. <laughs> I don't know what it means. The dreams make good stories. All right, let's go back. Let's re just rewatch that in full. Did you know that? I've been having dreams about a girl from Arrakis. I don't know what it means. The dreams make good stories. All right. So, he's a bit cheeky here. I ain't going to lie. He's a bit cheeky, because if you think about it, Denis Villeneuve just called his own movie really good. Because the character says this. Listen. What it means. The dreams make good stories. So he's got one character saying, I had a dream about this girl on Miracus, Miracus, whatever, a planet. And then the next fella's saying, dreams make good stories. Well, now he's basically saying, this is a good film. You should come watch it. But he's saying it in a really funny, interesting way that makes us kind of interested in finding out what this dream will really mean. But everything important happens when we're awake. So, first things first, let's just go back. This image is really, really important as well because it's again alluding to the fact that he's probably going to have to go on a huge journey. It's going to be probably uh, in those dunes and he's going to have to do it on his own. Now, they're talking about dreams. We don't know if this is a, a, an image from one of his dreams, um, but we can only assume at this point. I haven't seen the film, and I know it's going to be completely different to the original film, but I'm super excited still. It's going to be great. Stories. And everything important happens when we're awake. Hey, you. You want some muscle? I do. No. All right, so again, a really endearing moment between friends. They share a little bit of a, a bit of a jab. Uh, and this again, 
makes us feel more connected to them because they feel more human. They're not one dimensional or even two dimensional. You know, they, they feel like there's more aspects, facets to their personality than just, hey, I want that and I'm going to go over there and get that. And hey, I'm really good at fighting. So that's all I'm going to do is I'm going to fight. And you'll see maybe later on we get a little bit of that. But because he's built these characters up, he's shown us a moment of character, of relationship it lends itself to building so much more weight later in the trailer. Now, it's not to say that I prefer this trailer to the first one because I kind of like mystery myself. Um, so I was more pumped up from watching the first one. Uh, this, this trailer kind of follows more of the standard cinematic tropes, standard trailer tropes. It does reveal a lot more. So, um, yeah, I mean, it probably helps people know what type of movie they're about to go into and helps them decide if they're going to actually go spend their 5, 10, 20, wherever you live. I don't know how much you pay for your cinema, but plenty enough money to go watch a movie. We are a house of trades. There is no call. We do not answer. Okay. Again, with the whole, these guys have massive machinery and it's epic so we get that the trade is there is massive i mean it looks like a gigantic bluetooth speaker in my opinion which you know it's a bit odd but you'll notice something that we get a really good idea of scale again and if you remember what i was saying at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the trailer he deals with scale in terms of speed of motion so let's just watch it again we are a house of trades. There is no call. It's a very, very short clip. But the speed at which the feet land. Also, when we cut out wide, there's still a very slight amount of motion to that massive bowling ball slash Bluetooth speaker. We are a house of trades. There is no call. We do That's an epic shot. Also, take a look at the floor. We are a house of trades. If you see right down in the bottom, I'm going to use my arrow here so you can actually see on the screen as well. Down at the bottom, there's a gigantic army. So that gives us a super good idea of just how big the base is going to be on that Bluetooth speaker. It's going to be, it's going to be pretty loud. I ain't going to lie. Um, but with that said, it does feel epic. And actually, this really reminds me of Denis Villeneuve's 2015 film Arrival, uh, which again had massive spaceships that just happened to be hovering just above the Earth. And did he did a lot there to make sure we understood the scale of the spaceship wherever it was in the world. But let's let's continue because we're starting to build some more of the world now. We're starting to build the scale of this story and we're understanding a little bit more about the characters. There is no call, we do not answer. There is no faith that we betray. Smile, Gurney. I am smiling. I mean, apart from, you know, it's always a good choice to bring on Mr. Brody, Thanos himself. Uh, let's just go back and take a look at what we just saw. So, after the Bluetooth speaker... There is no call, we do not answer. We get a little scene seeing our protagonist in a bit of a fight sequence. It feels like it's a training situation because you see in the background, you've got some training dummies uh, and you've even got motifs on the wall of various martial arts. So we get an idea that he's not in danger at this point, but we get a little bit of kind of an action beat going on in the background. There is no faith. But from this, even though we've seen that, you know, the protagonist is not that physically big, he seems to be relatively proficient and his tutor or whoever he was sparring with seems to be quite proud of him at this moment. So that lets us know without having to say, I'm really good at fighting or seeing him beat up 300 people that he's a good fighter. So I like that. I, I, I'm not a big fan of when movies have these gigantic like, hey, it's me against an entire army Batman star. I mean, Batman can do it, but it's tricky when you've got, you know, other characters doing it and they don't have so much kind of lore behind them. And in this case, I think he did a really smart move by having a situation where you've got maybe, you know, tutor and pupil 
and the tutors looking very proud of their achievement in terms of their battle prowess. And that's kind of a really nice way of doing it. That we betrayed. Smile, Gurney. Again, you've got this kind of conflict going on between religion and, and what probably looks like an authorita authoritarian state. We can't really tell too much right now, but obviously this guy's looking pretty military right now. Nice little joke. Again, he's trying to show that there's a little bit more brevity. This is totally different to the original trailer where there was zero humor, zero brevity in the entire movie. Now, Denis Villeneuve is not known for making hilarious movies, but in this case, I think maybe they're learning from what happened with Blade Runner, uh, where the movie was seen to be maybe a little bit too serious for a lot of cinema goers. And so it didn't do so well in the cinemas. Now, I love that movie. I thought it was an incredible successor to the original Blade Runner. Um, but I think he's learning about what audiences want to see. And ultimately, we as directors want to make movies for people to watch and enjoy and escape into. And science fiction is one of the most incredibly rich genres to escape into. I am smiling. The Emperor asks us to bring peace to Arrakis. House of Trades, accept! So, now we've got the motivation for the story really to start. So we've got our lead character, he's dreaming of his lovely desert girl. Uh, we know what he wants. And then now we know that a larger force, a um, an army, an armada by the looks of it, has a reason to go to the same planet, Arrakis. Again, we hear it. So now we have an idea of the potential conflict that might occur because they've got to bring peace. It's quite um, quite apt for this current time, maybe. I mean, for those of you, maybe. Maybe seeing it, maybe not. I don't know. I know you. All right. So we've got the two have finally met and we're about, we're just over a third, between a third and halfway through the trailer. So... With the promise of him going on this journey to meet the dream girl. And we know that this is probably going to tie into his psychological journey. So his what he needs to overcome to become the character he needs to become by the end of the story. So this is an interesting time to put it in for me. I mean, and then we'll see why they've done that in a little bit. There's something waking in my mind. So let's just go back. Let's just watch this again. Trades, accept. I know you. There's something weird thing in my mind. So, I mean, there's a lot of mushed sound here. There's a lot of um, large, uh, very cinematic sounding big moments they're really trying to build it up now uh, we're we are coming towards the the midpoint of the trailer and, and and just like even in a movie we need to have a midpoint twist so he's starting to raise the stakes at this point you need to face your fears okay so now we get one of the major problems for our lead character you need to face your fears she's looking Either disapproving or worried. I'm not too sure which one, but we'll go with one of those. Come with me. Okay, was that the halfway point? We're not quite at the halfway mark, but you could you could say that that was probably the halfway point. So, in a way, we're getting an idea that he's being invited to not mutiny but switch sides at the midway point of the trailer, much in the same way that you probably will find that the movie will follow this very same structure as the trailer. We are introduced to this character and his dream world and his interest in this dream girl that he keeps dreaming of. Then he finds that his family that happens to have this massive army are invited to bring peace to the very same world that happens to have this girl. Coincidence, I think not. And then halfway through, he's invited to switch sides. So he has to make a choice between family and, well, dream girl 
obviously. Come with me. Epic, again, we kind of come back into building more of the conflict. You need to be ready. So, I mean, right there, we see these massive ships and it does look like they are on the desert planet now. Ah, this is interesting. We've got a nice warm looking world. Need to be ready. And if you look at the character in the background here is in the armor, his armor is not black. Also, this is a really nice way of again showing scale by starting on the character in the foreground and then racking focus to the background. We get a sense of just how far away those objects are because of the of the way the lens will focus into the background. So again, we're getting even more details here about the, you know, the major force here that's going to be a problem. Let's just go back again and just watch it from here. You need to be ready. You never met Arcanists before. They're not human. They're brutal. Duke suddenly sees too much. I mean, I definitely feel like Denis Villeneuve is using. Um, elements of black and white juxtaposing forces. Again, we kind of go back to this concept of nature versus technology. I mean, this is just pretty epic, in my opinion. It just looks incredible. It actually reminds me a lot of Alien, in a way. The, um, the main uh, architect of the Alien movies, uh, so, uh, let's continue, let's continue, because this is just, oof. Did you kill them all? God in heaven. So again, he does this drop, he takes all the music away for another big drop, a big explosion. So at the beginning we had that as well, and this time it gets even bigger, so raising the stakes. Get everything with guns off the ground, go! This is an extermination. Now, this is really, really important, this moment. We're just halfway past the middle point. We haven't really seen too much of the character's journey for the lead character. But you'll notice he's now in white clothes instead of in black clothes. Again, denoting character change at some point. Um, we don't know if this might be earlier in the movie, in actuality, but... For the trailer, again, they want to show character change. And by doing that, we have to ask ourselves, how did they change? How were they challenged to change? In fact, I just finished recording an episode earlier today on Fight Club and how character, cha character change actually forced the way in which the end of Fight Club happens. And for those of you who've not uh, seen Fight Club, uh, block your ears now. When he shoots himself, in the mouth, it literally is the only way for him to actually deal with T Tyler Durden, to, for him to actually get over his own psychosis. So in this very same way, for us to see character change, for, the, for us to see the character overcome elements of his own psychological, moral, or psychological needs. So in this case, we're seeing that he doesn't seem to believe in himself. He might be young and naive. Um, and these are elements that obviously the story is going to push him to overcome. They're picking my family off one by one. Let's fight back demons. I mean, again, he says earlier in that clip, they're picking my family off one by one. So now we get a change in the story. So earlier we heard that his family, the father, was saying that they have been assigned to go and bring peace to this planet. And now we're past the halfway point and that same family are being picked off one by one. And we can only assume that given the sheer power, the, the ships that were being blown up, that it is a force even stronger than their own. And maybe the enemy of my enemy type situation is my friend. Maybe we don't know. But again, it's bringing us back to this idea of David versus Goliath. 
facing up against a far bigger and far stronger enemy. Okay, I mean Denis Villeneuve is is I mean he's really getting kind of a <laughs> kind of a name for making incredibly pretty looking images, and he does not know how to do a science fiction image. Again, look at the way he's created scale in this image. It's just, it's stunning. He's used contrast to show us the size of human beings in that port on the ship. So we realize just how big that ship is. Just how big this scene is. So good, so smart to do that. Because quite often you probably see in science fiction films, they, you know, the inside of the ship would be very, very dark, very dim. And so they'd kind of just be mush. At this time, a type of scale, you need lots of contrast to see something of that size. Uh, what if I'm not the future of House Atreides? So again, I think this is really important. We're, ju we're, we're kind of jumping between the scale of this story and the intimate journey of this protagonist who is obviously dealing with more... Uh, confidence issues, naivety, and, and, and trying to work out what his purpose is. Can we just say scale again? A great man doesn't seek to lead. He's called to it. But if your answer is no, this will be the only thing I ever needed you to be. My son. This is such a, again, building relationships that we can care about. Father and son relationship in a really touching moment where the father says something that's incredibly poignant. You will never let me down because you've already been the thing that I needed most from you and that is being my son. Beautiful words and it lets us know so much about the characters. We realize that the father is not a tyrant, not someone who's going to push our character to become something he's not. So in this way, we can assume, because we haven't really had too much information about his family until this point, that the father's probably a good guy and he's not gonna be, you know, the whole destroy the world type. Uh, maybe bringing peace is a good thing. Who knows? If anything happens. Okay, so this, this is the last minute of the trailer. And this, for most trailers these days, is what I would call the moment of promise. So we get one minute of telling us, hey, so all that stuff you saw at the beginning of the trailer, well, all of that's gonna culminate in everything I'm just about to throw at you really, 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 really fast. And I'm not gonna tell you how you get there, but I'm gonna kind of promise that a lot of really cool things are gonna happen. So it's not all talk. There's big badass moments as well. Will you protect Paul with my life? I, I, well, uh, I mean, like 10 shots in three seconds and so many things they just promised us. Let's just go back quickly. And let, I mean, look. Psh. Big explosion. Will you protect Paul with Will you protect Paul with my life? So now we know this is life and death. She's in there immediately. So we get that immediate plant and payoff with my life. She means it because obviously she's there. And I mean, she's a badass as well. So that's great. So we now we, we know that she's pretty strong. So we've got that dragonfly again, the dragon, same dragonfly type ship that we saw at the beginning, but this time it's pulling off a pretty fast uh, maneuver, almost like, you know, a little skid around. Again, raising the ante, taking up the danger a notch. Now the very next shot, we see it right on the screen right now. We see the father, a bloody handprint on his shoulder. And then immediately we're given a plant and payoff. They're not necessarily connected shots, just like the mother, well, this lady, we don't know if she's the mother, maybe she's not, but you know, whatever. We get the father looking like he's in pain, and then we get the son who screams out no. So again, it's the, oh, did he die type question. So now they're really raising questions and promises and saying, look, you know, if you come watch this movie, we're gonna answer what happens. No 
Stay together, please. Oh, okay. Again, like 20, 20 million shots in like half a second. Uh, again, we're getting even more promise of tons of action, which actually that was probably one of the biggest things with the original movie, the original Dune movie, uh, that uh, it was a lot of talk and not much action. Uh, I think uh, also with Blade Runner, uh, same thing. It was seen as a very slow movie. So they're really trying to counter that uh, dialogue that happened off of the, the previous Denis Villeneuve movie and the previous Dune movie. Um, so they're really trying to make sure this is not seen as the same thing, not a rehash of the same story. All together, please. Promise of romance, but not actually showing it. Take a chance. Epic scale again. I mean, look at that. All together, please. Take a chance. So, I mean, it's not like we're seeing... 30 million people. It's not like a massive Lord of the Rings scale um, Northern Wall versus the White Walkers uh, type battle. But it still feels incredibly epic because of the size of the dunes around them. Again, using colour differentiation because to be honest, a lot of their armour looks very similar. I have a funny feeling that this shot's actually from the beginning of the movie, before the character changes. Because if you see, he's in very gaudy looking armor. His armor doesn't really suit that of the sand people that we uh, have been seeing glimpses of throughout the film. And actually, we don't really get to see them much. This is a lot more about his own journey, uh, the lead's own journey, maybe away from the family that he had. I don't know. <laughs> Beautiful. You know, this is Denis Villeneuve wait, waiting to give us a massive drop again. And then we get the biggest question of all. All the way through this, we've seen these people with bright blue eyes, which is one of the most clearly aesthetic um, differentiators with this science fiction story over any of the others. Uh, and now he has blue eyes too. And we're like, whoa, how did he get blue eyes? This is a great way of ending the trailer, which I believe we're right at the very end. Yeah, look at that. Can we just like take a moment to, to appreciate how beautiful that title is? And then also the, the sound, the music, the, the voice in the background is incredibly beautiful as well. Oh, and then look at the E. Look at that. A little uh, solar eclipse star to create the middle of the E. It's just a, it's just a really nice touch. It's, it's letting us know we're in space. This is a big galactic story and it's going to encompass an entire planet's potential future. It's great. It's just constantly letting us know the scale of it versus the personal journey. And I think that's what a lot of science fiction movies, they either get the personal really good or they get the scale really good, but I think Denis Villeneuve has is, is got that really great balance between the two, and I think that's why, I mean, I personally get super excited anytime I see Denis Villeneuve's just doing anything, really. Um, you know, going to buy coffee, it's great. Huge scale, it's brilliant. So, guys, and girls, sorry, apologies. Everyone, I really hope you enjoyed today's analysis. Do check out my other videos on my channel and don't forget I do release episodes on Thursdays and Sundays as well and I really look forward to uh, seeing you next time.